I'm Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Shallon Winery with Paul Vandervelt. It's March 30th, 2017. And Paul, we're going to start you off by asking, why wine? I noticed that you asked other people that, so I had to think about that in advance. Uh, it, it wasn't so much the wine. It was my interest in the process, or in the process of, of uh, yeast things and uh, the science of it and, and then wine was naturally a uh, necessary part of that so I went into <clears throat> amateur wine making when I was interested in that subject and I was trying to figure out how long ago that was and that was almost 50 years ago and um, and then it got into wine and uh, I uh, thought well I better start a winery and I only wanted to do, uh, do it with local uh, berries, and I have a specific one that I can talk about, which is wild evergreen blackberry, which was the has identified the winery for the last 36 years, and uh, it went on with that. And I thought I would grow, but I've always stayed the same until now, which is a one-man operation practically. But uh, I, the science of it, and uh, finally, there's a winery that has come on a line that I just noticed um, there was in um, Wine Business Magazine uh, in California that was my dream winery that I dreamed of 30 some years ago and I would love to visit it. Um, it has totally automatic mm -hmm. with all these, with the data on and ceiling, oh, okay. everything. Awesome. Anyway, the, but that's the reason, and I'm still mostly interested in in the science of it and the, how they. So, when you started, uh, how did you learn? Well, it, it was books, and of course, in those days, and in the amateur field, uh, the best information was uh, a lady um, and a lady friend of mine in subsequent years who ran the amateur winemaking shop in Portland, Ann McCullum. Uh, she, in, in those days, I would say she knew more about wine than any other winemaker in Oregon. But in those days, she was a lady, and she wasn't given that credit, it seemed to me, as I remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I learned a lot from her. And then I got into it, and I, um, I took a couple of uh, those few-day, one-week courses at UC Davis that I go down there. And then, subsequently, a lot of them at, at uh, Oregon State, uh, Barney Watson mm -hmm. particularly, and those people, and, and um, help from uh, people like Myron Redford and others of those in the old days. So when you decided to start a winery, at what point did you decide you could do it professionally? Like you could make a living with a winery? I really didn't think about making the living so much. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, uh, is obvious. And so, but I just wanted to let people enjoy these things that I wanted them to, to enjoy what I had made that I liked. And things that were unique. And unfortunately, I can't even drink anymore, and I don't even think about the ordinary wines on the market out there. Another thing, because I ask each of my guests uh, what they work at, and mm -hmm. I learn a lot. I don't even have to wait for a doctor's appointment. Seriously. I'm usually waiting for computer geek, but that's sort of hopeless nowadays. <laughs> uh, and, and they tell me there's an enzyme in our system that handles alcohol through our liver. And as we age, that declines. Mine is totally zip gone, which mm. is horrible because I make wine, I love wine. Um, and my doctor said, well, maybe you start slowly, you can build it up. It doesn't work too well. My waiter sort of raised an eyebrow when I asked for 200 milliliters of wine. <laughs> uh, and so I allow myself one half glass of Cabernet once a week, and even that's too much, mm. which is unfortunate. But I taste it, I have to try to taste it to see that they haven't oxidized. Sure, sure. So we, we, we know you have an interesting early work history as well. Can you kind of take us through some of your early jobs and sort of how they influenced how you ended up here? That's sort of long and involved. I don't want to bore you. Um, we were, we're happy to hear it. Um, I, um, 
When I got out of the Navy, I went back to school at uh, California State Polytechnic, uh, majoring in aeronautical engineering. And uh, I wanted to go to work for Goodyear because I was only interested in lighter than air, as you might have noticed. Mm -hmm. In there, uh, and after about three years of that, uh, I changed. Goodyear was moving their facilities from Phoenix, and I didn't want to take any from going back east to uh, Akron or any place like that. Uh, and at that time, was my, we had a small heavy construction company, my, and I, which I come up here summers, of course. And my dad's partner had died, and he needed help, so I pushed more uh, civil engineering into my courses, even though I had changed my English to speech and literature, and I was going to teach. And so I had to come out and run a construction company or manage a construction company for uh, 10 some years. And um, um, that was very valuable. And all of those uh, exposures to uh, various subjects was very handy for being a winery because the winery draws on every single thing I have ever been exposed to. Whereas if I, I would have forgotten all of them, otherwise mm -hmm. having some limited profession, you know. And, uh, and we were going to phase out the construction company anyway, so I started to, well, I'll do the, maybe I'll have a winery as one of the options. It was either having a foundry or uh, um, 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 what are the plants? Uh, my mind goes at my age. That's okay. Um, artichoke. I was going to have an artichoke farm, nice. a foundry, or a winery. Nice. <laughs> Good decisions. Good decisions. And, well, it is because the artichoke thing failed totally. <laughs> And if I were a founder, I can imagine what the regulations would be on such a thing today, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So the winery was the thing, and it's sort of a foundry in a way. And, and, oh, and then, then I had to go do something as work when I was starting the winery, so I went cooking on ocean-going tugs. And even that contributes sure. to the winery. Sure. Food and things. So, were you a cook before that? Did you teach yourself how to cook for no, that job? No, uh, that was hard because I, um, I, don't, I like cooking and I was really into food and I, I have over a thousand cookbooks. <laughs> uh, which I stopped because I read her, was it, collections are male ego trips. <laughs> What's the, what was the need for that? And I found I was buying the, the same book the second and third time, so obviously. <laughs> uh, so that's handy. And, um, but I had to work really hard because I didn't know. Sure. But, but that was one of the most... And I would bring wine aboard for my crew. Sure. And, um, and, and cook with the wine and things. And that was one of the most pleasant things in my life, when you get accolades for cooking, like when you get accolades for your wine. Sure. So when you, op when you opened your winery, why did you decide to name it Shallon? Oh, that's the name. My favorite, and that was the name of the farm where I was going to start the artichoke plant. Um, you lab people ask that, I talk about the label. So shall I tell you about the label now? Sure, please. My standard label. These are the three significant geographical features of our county here. Saddle Mountain, Young's River Falls, and the Pacific Ocean. You can see Saddle Mountain from the column at the top of the hill. Those beautiful falls are out here in the country, 12, 15 miles, but if you saw the movies Binge the Hunted, Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 or Free Willy 2, you'll see Young's River Falls. And they're blown up in the light panel in the room summer and winter. This is a wreath of Salal, S-A-L-A-L, Salal, which you guys may or may not know what is. You don't. 
Salal grows from southern Alaska to northern California, west of the Coast Range, all along the highway. Nobody pays any attention to it. Half the people that grew up here don't know what it is. The other has mothers or grandmothers thought it was poisonous, so it's the least <laughs> utilized of any wild berry. It's not poisonous. The Indians use it all the time, and it's shipped all over the country for florist shops used for greenery. It is called lemon leaf in florist shops. If you get a dozen roses, you'll probably get salal with it. It probably was sacred to the Indians. I've studied it all, most of my life, and I can tell a lot about Salal. Uh, it, it's the name of the winery, because the Latin name for Salal is Galtheria Shalon, which I think is one of the most beautiful alliterative Latin names of anything. And that isn't even the Latinized version of Salal. I don't like a lot of plant names would be. This is what Lewis and Clark wrote down the Indians were calling it. Uh, okay. It has a round black berry that doesn't have much juice. You can make pie or jam out of it though. But the berries do not sustain bacteria, yeast, or mold. So they sit on the vine and sort of wither away if not picked. And this is what they would look like withered away after several years. And that's a real worn out salal leaf which you recognize the shape of. And I have a lot of them on the porch right outside the door. Uh, and the irony of this is, it's the name of the winery, but I can't make wine out of Salal. No, ma no matter what I do, I can't mix it with anything or anything, because it will not sustain anything. I have a, a barrel sitting in there, totally open, uh, with air in it, which you wouldn't let any wine no, do. Sure. I made it. There's nothing on the surface whatsoever, <laughs> because it will not sustain anything. That's amazing. And it's amazing. Anyway, that's the story about the lake. See, if you ask questions like that, I'll never get, get the needle off the record. Wonderful. This is great stuff. <laughs> so, uh, when you, you said, you, why, why fruit and chocolate wines? Why not grape wines? Well, because everybody else is doing it. Uh, I, uh, <laughs> why should I compete with anybody else when I have some unique problem? Because originally, I wanted to have a big winery. I was going to do the, the, that particular blackberry uh, totally. In a, with a major project. In fact, I, having been in construction and engineering, I've, there were um, there were drain silos out on the port here for years that were about uh, oh, 50, 60 feet tall, as I remember, and about 12, 15 feet in diameter concrete. That, I visualize them exactly how to uh, seal them. Mm -hmm. I have stainless piping running in the river for cooling and knowing how to do this and have everybody in the whole uh, Lower Columbia River picking blackberries and then, <laughs> and, and then really producing it and marketing and selling. Well, that's as long as it's gone, you know. Sure. So, uh, but, but that now has identified the winery for, 30, for 36 years as the, the wild evergreen blackberry, which, I'm going to go on and on. Please, yeah, please, please leave. We, we love it. This is great. And th this would be this one. Uh, and do you know the difference between the blackberries? Have you? Do you have black? There are some blackberries in Hawaii. So, so, and do you know? Mm -hmm. There are two major ones on the highways. Now, down in the valley where you are, there are a lot of hybrids, so they're mixed in with a lot of things. But in general, on the highway, if you look closely, there are two kinds of blackberries. One with a dark green jagged leaf, that is the wild evergreen, and another one with a rounder leaf. The one with the rounder leaf is called the Himalayan, and the bacon last year is sorry to see more of those with the rounder leaf. But I'm the only wine with that makes wine out of that specific variety of the wild evergreen. It had a woodsy flavor like wet moss, dry alder leaves, soggy stumps, mushrooms, went nice, totally dry, went nicely with wild meat like venison or duck, and would age like a Cabernet. Other mm. fruit and berry wines do not do that. The rule of thumb for fruit and berry wines is that they should be consumed within the year. And I was getting eight, 10, and 12 year reports from people that had a bottle that long. They were ecstatic, but they late to take it home and pull it on their wine snob friends down the road a couple <laughs> of years. Because by that time they say it could be mistaken for Cabernet. I say, big deal, buy Cabernet. <laughs> but little old ladies pick the berries, and my little old ladies are dying off. Kids won't do it, no matter how much you pay them anymore. I used to like to have 50, 60 cases for the year. I had four cases last mm. year, and I have four cases coming up. What do you do? Uh, people bring me, I have one over here that somebody brought me that they had in their cellar for 20 some years. I'm not going to open it, I wouldn't. But, so that's what I do, and, uh, and, but that's gone. I will maintain that as long as I can, even with a few cases, just to have it. Mm -hmm. 
And if we go into tasting wine, I had the first year I've ever made one with Himalaya. And oh my gosh. There's a story between why that is. And that sweet, and that would not be something that would be aged. Um, but then the important thing was, was the, uh, the whey wines, and that's the only thing that I feel that I want to leave to posterity. Yeah, we heard a little about whey wines. So tell us a little bit about whey wines. Well, people say, well, why did you do that? I said, well, it was a challenge, and that's what life is, is a challenge. Um, I shouldn't cast aspersions on any um, institutions or anything. I am not. It's just that um, um, there's so much whey produced in the, in the country um, out of little uh, cheese factories all over the country mm -hmm. and produce a lot of whey. I have been making the assertion that whey is the most nutritious thing in the world per unit. I've done two things, unless I agree with that, when they stop to think about it. Everything you buy in the grocery store, there's going to be whey in it. Um, well, they had so much whey, what are you going to do with it? Now, this, I'm, I'm talking about now already 20 years or more ago. They had too much left over, what are you going to do with it? They feed all the pigs in the county the whey mm -hmm. because they're nutritious. And then they still have whey left over. What do you do with it? So they put it in holy ponds that would deteriorate and be smelly. and and and. Farmers from Idaho and places uh, tell me that they'd have to get permits to put it on the soil because naturally it's good fertilizer. Uh, well, even I back then was wondering, I hate huge companies marketing and I can't believe them. Sure. Uh, they have cadres of spies going out to other companies to find out how they do it. Why don't they just do their own thing? And why it took them probably, I would say, almost 20 years to discover how valuable whey was. They should have known it a long time ago. Well, finally, they finally discovered it was valuable. <laughs> and now it's snapped up. And it's in everything you buy in the grocery store. Sure. But then again, the marketing, which bothers me, and I hate to lapse into that because I do that every day just about. I hate marketing. It's a part of my business, but I hate it. Mm -hmm. And it's always become such a, a greed nowadays and, and narrowing in such a narrow field. And I'm very amused, but irritated slightly when I have a group of young men in here. And I mentioned this about whey. Oh, they know where whey is because they take whey protein drinks for their muscles. And it abuses me. And then I snap out a card and say, this is what's in whey. Every conceivable thing that you could possibly need. Anyway, but now there's no longer it. But anyway, the challenge of whey, because uh, or they, they thought, well, if they uh, made wine out of whey at those small cheese factories, that would take care of the problem, number one, and number two, it would increase the economy of the area. Well, it never worked, and I know now of why, because I've seen the work, and as some other professors then say, well, <laughs> the professors work to get their grant money, and then they turn the mandatory project over to a graduate student who couldn't care less about it. And I've seen the work. I, I've seen the errors in their work. And mm -hmm. If Gallo wanted to do it, I'm sure Gallo could do it. Gallo has 22 PhDs in their lab. I'm sure they can do anything they want to do, but I'm sure Gallo doesn't want to do it because if I may say so, great wine is the cheapest stuff in the world to make. That's why there's so much marketing about it. When you're making this kind of thing, it's very expensive and a lot of red tape with following government regulations and, you're, and you really have to have a lab to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm sorry about that lecture. <laughs> <laughs> no, please don't. Please, that's awesome. Um, do you have a winemaking philosophy? I anticipated that question. Yes, wine is a food. The alcohol is sheerly incidental. I will, in fact, that's the next project I had to go on is to be making something that is non-alcoholic. Because I actually have sort of a aversion uh, to alcohol in a way also. Mm -hmm. I have to admit that I was a beeraholic for about 40 years of my life. And I see what damage it does to people, and I'm, I'm afraid that that story is becoming sort of a swill town like it was 100 years ago. I'm now surrounded by six breweries, mm. and that's what people come in for the breweries. Uh, and as I tell my guests, 
if you want to get drunk, well, drink hard liquor and beer. If you want alcohol for volume, drink the beer. But wine is a food, and, and the alcohol is somewhat incidental, and you can enjoy wine for three things. The appearance of it, the beauty of it, the aroma of it, which is extremely important, and the flavor. Otherwise, that's what it should be. And, the, and when I have a lot of amateur winemakers in, because I'm so small, they want to relate, and they rarely understand the difference between being a bonded winery and being an amateur, or we have to do exactly what the government tells sure. us to do. Sure. Uh, but I keep telling them that the important thing is when you're uh, adjusting these things is the human body knows exactly what um, naturally fermented great wines from the temperate regions of the world taste like for so thousands of years. Man didn't even invent wine. Uh, you could say God made wine because the vinifera grapes falling into a depression in a rock uh, would make wine. They have the right proportions of solids and acids and sugars in them and even their own yeast on the exteriors to make, say, 12% wine. They don't need 13 to keep exactly and 11 isn't quite enough. How does that grab you? Uh, of course, they made fruit and berry. They made fruit wines in the ancient days with honey, but that never turned out that wonderful anyway. So the human body, after millions, thousands and thousands of years of knowing what great wine tastes like, has to have that balance in their mouth. So fruit and berry wines have to sort of imitate that. And then you have to follow the government regulations on that because the government determines what wine is by definition mm -hmm. and what you have to do with it. And so the balance has to be about the same, and that taste in the mouth of the alcohol, the acids, and the sweetness has to be in the same balance. Anyway, I'm sorry. That's, that's a great philosophy. That's one of the best answers we've ever had for that question. Lecture on that subject. <laughs> Uh, so, with your flavors, how do you come up with the, the, uh, your ideas for flavors? Do you... No, no, it's not adding flavors to things. It's, it's appreciating the thing itself. Okay. And, uh, and that's why my lab is so elaborate, because I really got into... Um, in, well, in my life, I had a super nose. Or my employees call me super nose. You believe what I can smell. I... But it's fading, too, with my age, as with everything else is. Uh, but um, I got off the track on that one. Talk about wine flavors. Yeah, well, so I studied that more intensely, particularly about aromas. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I have all the equipment that I can do. What I wanted to do is uh, distill uh, different fruits and berries and see exactly where we get down to that and also how that referred to making wine out of it and things, which I have all the equipment necessary, which I don't do anymore. And uh, the, um, I, uh, the aromas, yes, the aromas. Let me tell you about that. Okay. One of my wines that only have a case of so left because of the aromas in it. In studying about aromas, I really got into that. Um, and there, you may be aware, um, there's only about, um, I think it's about 200 perfume makers in the world, maybe two or 400, I can't remember. And uh, 100 or more work in uh, the United States and like in big companies in New York that are cranking out 50 gallon drums of uh, mm -hmm. perfume to go into soaps and things. Of all of those, some of the ones are super noses and they're, and they're called noses. Uh, we have one in Oregon. Uh, uh, Mr. Sabellis, uh, I don't know if he's still there, it's out on Hawthorne Boulevard, he has a wine, uh, perfume shop called uh, the House of Perfumes. His nose is so good, he is, was awarded the Golden Faberge Egg from France by his nose. And, and he's a character, and I'm just really into it, so I got to, and this is a relation sort of to my wine and mm -hmm. things too. Mm -hmm. And I got to talk to him. Firstly, and we related 
or the same attitude. Uh, uh, his, and that's the nature of value and price. Was for me to talk to him, being so such an amateur I am, would be like I decided I was be going to become an artist, and I was painting those little squares with colors on them, and I got to talk to Rembrandt. <laughs> and I like to tell this story about him because it's so wonderful. He had, I did the same thing with my wines. He has two, had two wines, it's been several years ago already, that were $200 a bottle, period. Actually, they were priceless, but that was the price. Mm -hmm. And one of them that I got to smell was made from um, um, uh, spruce needles in the like forests of Germany, I believe, maybe spruce needles. And say one drop of that in one bath water and an entire house would have diffused through a whole house. Hmm. Uh, and that was $200 a bottle. The second one was called the Rose of Sharon, I believe. It was made from uh, rose petals from Nepal. And it was $200 a bottle. There was no more of that at all. $200 a bottle, it was priceless. He had one, I love the story, he had one man that flew once a year from India to Los Angeles to Portland to pick up one bottle. And I would always ask him if he could buy the rest of them. No. So every year came from a bottle. He finally wondered what he did with it. And he, asked him, he drank his, put a drop on his tongue and drank his tea. So oh, thanks. Was, was some. But, but that, was my beautiful example of value and price. Hmm. Sure. Anyway, that's what I feel about some of these wines. Like this particular one is priceless. It's beyond all concept, I think, but that's priceless. Uh, and I got the needle off the record again. <laughs> no. What makes you decide to do like a chocolate orange wine? Oh, the chocolate, because I love chocolate. What? How are you going to handle the chocolate orange? Oh yeah, let me give you that pitch. <laughs> and I got down to this. I ask people what they work at and I write it down, which I haven't done for you yet. And um, um, Half of my guests are IT people of some kind or other. They're either um, twisting wires together doing software or something. And they always jump on me for the next statement I'm going to make. They finally have conceded that Google is a verb and I can use it indiscriminately for what I'm going to say next. 20 years ago, if you would have Googled and they jump on me, whatever we did back then, <laughs> uh, uh, chocolate wine, who would? But people did. My name would come right to the top and the only one for 20 some years. It was up to 5% of my business because people would email and chop it. Wine? Question mark. Well, the last couple of years I'm dead in the water. There are now 20, 30, or 40 of them on the market out there. Uh, somebody said 100 the other day. And almost every day somebody in here has got one as a present, even as a wedding present, because they're cheap and novel. You can give them as a present. You see, a couple of years ago, there was a sudden uptick in chocolate flavors for everything, even beer. So mm -hmm. wineries sort of figured, well, sucker in the youngest possible consumer. Who would that be? They're now 21. They're not going to wineries. We got chocolate wine for you. And they wouldn't know the difference. And yes, I had a young lady in here that had just turned 21, and she liked that idea because it was like going to the grocery store and getting a bottle of chocolate milk, except there was alcohol in it. <laughs> in fact, that would be a far superior product, incidentally. I didn't know how they were made until the wine writers at the Seattle Times wrote about them. Half of those out there are made with a cream base with grain alcohol for the alcohol yeah. and artificial flavoring. How can you even conceive of that as a beverage? I don't know how the government approved it. The other half are made with a cheap red grape wine. They won't use the good one, of course, with cocoa flavoring. And they're cheap. They're $10, $12 a bottle or cheaper on sale. And the worst one of all, or well, in my opinion, because they're the best marketer, uh, it's choco vine from Holland. There's a windmill on the label, and it really irritates me because my dad's from Holland. <laughs> that company, I think it was a year before last year or so, for that one single product, 
wine business must they had in there for that one single product grows over ten million dollars. <laughs> what can I do? Even if they write about this now, they just oh well that's made in Oregon. Well yeah, for twenty years it's made in Oregon. <laughs> 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 then I go on and I serve it and so forth. And that's the story behind the chocolate. Now back but why the chocolate and orange? Well that is orange whey wine. Okay with chocolate suspended in it. And that's my secret, is how to suspend the chocolate in the orange white wine without using emulsifiers or other artificial junk. If that were Hershey's, it would all fall to the bottom of the bottle. It would also taste like sand going down. So the three challenges were the suspension of the chocolate, the mouthfeel, and the flavor, and the permutations are that outraged. I'm lucky. Every time I lose the chocolate, I have to go through a whole process all over again to figure it out. And so that's the story behind that. And so it's different. And so technically, it's orange whey wine with chocolate suspended. Yeah, right. Okay. You can't ferment chocolate. I would think not. No, so. No. And so, all those things. Much of my amazement every day when somebody's talking about that. I've only had one customer in all these years that said they had tasted one of those things on the market. They liked it. I mean, everybody else, has, if they've ever tasted, no. <laughs> you can't. No. And the reason for the orange is because way back, this was 20 some years ago when I started, well, the question was, what was the fruit uh, that you go with the chocolate? At that point, uh, you guys are too young to remember that maybe. Um, it was raspberry for several years, which went with chocolate. Mm -hmm. And then the orange was the upcoming thing. But now even that's sort of fading, and you know, now they like outrageous things like peppers and things in mm -hmm. the chocolate. So what do you do? So what's it, what has it been like owning and operating a winery so far from the rest of the industry? Has there been advantages? Have there been challenges because of that? Oh dear, yes. Because I'm not a very good businessman. I, visually, how I'm going to do it, I follow all the rules and I go to the college and take these courses and things. But as boiled down that I'm doing what I want to do I make the wines that people want to buy, and I have to make enough to keep pay the overhead. Mm -hmm. It's getting a little worse and worse. Or as I usually start out quibbling, if it weren't for Social Security, I wouldn't be eating. Mm. But that's what I want to do. And I have a target by the tail, and I wouldn't let it go. And it, I, as I say, it now has absolutely become my, my guests are my life. I have no other social activities. I don't have a family anymore with anything. Mm. So that's, that, that's my guess, my family. And I'm delighted. It bothers me because I wish I could remember every single one of them, their faces, their names, and their occupations, which I always in, sure. put down, but I can't keep up with it. But it's wonderful to have them come back um, because they want to come back and relate. And I can't believe, well, that brings up another philosophic thing that <laughs> you sort of broached on. People say, well, when are you going to retire? Well, my entire life is a retirement, so. Well, what, are these, what does retirement mean? They're doing nothing. They die a year later or something. And uh, my dad came from the old country and we're in construction and he always irritated me by he was constantly mentioning production, production, production. Well, I feel that way now. You've got to produce something to merit your existence. <laughs> and that's what I'm doing is producing. So that's what I'm looking for. I really get something to look forward. I can't believe how anybody can sit and do nothing and not have something. I, I agree. agree. And, and so the poor people, they do now. There's all this stuff of volunteering for this and that and the other thing, which I wish I had time to do a lot of stuff. But now I have to spend the entire time trying it. Because now a third of my time is spent in paperwork. Mm. Mm. As I tell people that, that tell them, you know, when I started, I felt that I spent 25 hours a day on the winery. Well, I still have to spend the three same 25 hours, but the trouble is I'm getting slower. And the one thing that I can't alter is the paperwork. It sure. has to be done. They make no distinctions about size. Sure. I do the same paperwork as the Gallo does. 
And so it has to be done. In fact, I have a you know, my accountant was doing certain things and apparently he slipped up and I have a nasty letter from oh, <laughs> the agency that oh, said, well, I owe them a fine and all this sort of stuff and they were supposed to take care of it and stuff like that. And so everything else goes down slightly. But I can't also miss my guess. I used to start out 36 years ago from noon till 6 every single day. And then it went from noon to 1 to 6. And then it went from one to six, and then one to five, and now I'm at one to five. So quite an investment in time. Uh, and then nowadays, that I didn't have on the door when you came here, because all these years, mostly, the door was open, the people were on to come in. So maybe I'd have a dozen or two dozen people here, and I'd knock myself out related to each one, and that the one back and forth all the time. I'm not quite up to that anymore. And so I have a, had a doorbell, and the doorbells are made of nice chrome metal, and, and they would always burn out, and then I'd miss the people or something. I didn't hear the doorbell ring, and then I had a gong here, and then <laughs> I wouldn't hear that, and uh, so forth. And so finally, I put a little sign on the door. Now, de depending on my mood, um, <laughs> Well, you know, if there's a tour ship in, oh, yeah. I, I can't handle that at all. And they're not going to buy any wine anyway. They want to be entertained. So I have usually in, uh, I have different kinds of ones like uh, uh, buy a sort of like uh, today tours by appointment only. Or maybe not today or something. Mm -hmm. And nowadays I have one that I would put on the door if you'd been here on it. Um, I will open for you. And amazingly, that screens people beautifully. Sure. First, it loses me business. I could go out and grab them and drag them in and market them something. But if they're too much of a hurry to do this, they're too much of a hurry to be in here. Yeah. And nowadays, particularly, uh, I may say so, uh, <laughs> younger people, are getting more and more in a hurry and they want to take any time to do this. Sure. And that's why the bigger the winery is, it's handier for marketing now because they come running in and sell a lot of them, but I can't do that. Yeah. So they call and screens people. Anyway, that's, I've worn you out with all of this it's, absurd information. No, this is great. This is great. <laughs> this is great. We love it. <laughs> Did you ever consider going somewhere other than Astoria? Yes, I, my friend <clears throat> that bought 14 acres of mango forest on, 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 on the big island down there in the bottom end. Rainbow was on TV just last year, the lava was flowing. Well, that's where it was. Yeah. He got it for cheap, of course, because of the lava flowing. <laughs> Uh, but who cares at our age? Well, he died last year, I think it was anyway. And so I went down there and I was going to get I do the mango wine, which turned out beautifully, but I can't go on with that. I'd love to do it. It was sort of, in the, it was, a, it was not a whey wine, but it was the mango wine was sort of in this uh, category, uh, but it's a minimum shipping of a ton. And if you scoop it up, that's quite a disaster for me. Yeah. But it turned out very nicely, and I, I have all these nice labels for the mango. So I was going to get down there and get him started with a winemaker. I was going to phase out up here and start the winery down there. I thought maybe I'd retire on the, on the, big, on the big island at Hilo because I'm really into Japanese culture and there's a lot of small Japanese restaurants. But that's not that anymore either. So no, I don't want to go anyplace else. And I'm just as glad I'm as far as I am away from the rest of the wineries. Why is that? Well, I don't know. Uh, my colleagues, I never get to talk to them anymore. In, their, in the early days, I knew almost all of those guys. There was just a handful of more. And I'd go to the, uh, go to the uh, wine grower associated meetings once in a while, uh, yearly ones. And mm -hmm. I sort of gave up on that because it took a lot of time. And uh, I, I almost came to the conclusion that I think the reason they were wineries is because they were alcoholics. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and even they go, we have the wine, uh, the, um, um, the, the thing that started in Newport, 
Oh, the, the yeah, it's the wine and the wine and seafood it's, festival. It's, it's, we have one here in Astoria every mm -hmm. year, and they're all here. They have, they'll be. Oh, and then this one I have to put a sign on the door. Sure. If you've been to the crab festival, I'm sorry, I can't serve you because they will come. I don't believe it. At five o'clock, they'll call me, obviously drunk on the phone. Oh, we heard there's a winery in Astoria. <laughs> I, I really deplore that. I think it's a bad image for wine. Yeah. I really do. <laughs> uh, although I went to one once and it was a lot of fun, um, but it uh, didn't make any money. You sold a lot of wine, but then you had to have a lot of personnel there to, have to keep sure. the thing going. Sure. But uh, other than that, uh, they don't even come and visit rarely, yeah. which I would if I were going to a place like that, come to another winery. So I don't get to talk to them. Sometimes on the phone I used to call Myron once in a while and um, and then uh, Barney Watson. I haven't heard from Barney Watson for years. Maybe he's even dead. I don't know. We interviewed him a couple years ago. He's still doing great. Yeah. 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 He's yeah. still running his own winery. Uh, I believe... He has his own... It's not, he's no longer at... He was at Oregon State. He was at Oregon State. He stopped that. He was at Chemeco. He stopped that. Yeah. And he was at... Some winery in Carlton. Yeah. Oh, he's at another. Oh, yeah. I, I think I think he's mostly retired, if not yeah. totally retired. Yeah. Because yeah. he, he was teaching at Chemeca for a long time. And, yeah. Oh, he was teaching there too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, after, that, that's how far back I go. After, after Oregon State, he stopped, he helped get the Chemeca program yeah, going as well. Yeah. 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 So anybody besides Barney and Myron, anybody else you had a strong relationship with in the early yeah, days? Yeah, strong relationships. No. Well, I well I knew them. You know, like. Uh, um, um, you interviewed her, uh, well, uh, your colleague did, um, the one in Hillsborough, the, the Fruit and Berry Winery. That's oh. It. oh, 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 um, the Volstex. Volstex. Oh, Oak Knoll. Yeah, the Volstex. Oh, oh, those people are yeah. good. At, their meetings are particularly be held there I'm quite well. Mm -hmm. there is, and then I talked to others on the phone in the Sure. Oh, yeah, you know, my, when I need information nowadays, well, um, people like um, um, God, my mind is gross. It's okay. The um, where I get a lot of my uh, stuff from uh, California um, supplier of wine stuff. Why? Why is my is my totally gone? That's the trouble of getting older. <laughs> I understand. So I deal with them every every year or something for my yeast and my things. So. Sure, sure. Um, uh, go ahead. They have very good personnel there to answer questions. Mm -hmm. Do you have a an idea on where the sort of the future of your wines or the future of fruit and chocolate wines in general is going to go? Uh, the competition is going to get worse because uh, uh, the young people want novelties. I, I keep I read all the industry organs, and mm -hmm. that's what's happening. And uh, every new novelty has to come out. It's getting almost to the point of ridiculousness. I feel as though I'm fitting into one of those, and, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the products are getting so ridiculous. I, I now ship by UPS, and when I finally got approved by UPS, the lady said, "Nope." You're not approved. We don't ship your kind of stuff. <laughs> or, well, she's funny that it was flavored wines or something. No, it isn't quite the same thing, but anyway, I got through with that. But, but there's so much of that out there. Just anything, anything novel that come up is coming up. Mm -hmm. And that is equated with my stuff, and which I don't like. So I have to try to maintain the uniqueness of what this is and what it is not. Sure. And so I don't know. Uh, I have to maintain the way wines because that's my invention. That's my trade secret. And and uh, in addition of which, I um, well, let me give you the. We haven't been drinking it yet. I'm giving you the pitch for the wine. Go ahead. But um, the um, my grand delay. Seventy-some thousand people have tasted that, and hardly two dozen people 
in 36 years of flat out dislike. Now that's outrageous because all kinds of likers dislikers. And that isn't a fair assessment anyway because the last two ladies that disliked it, for example, were allergic to milk products and they sensed that. I know it's on the label. Um, many have worked in the dairy all their life and fairly detect what that might be because it is not a flavor, it is a mouse feel. And that's what makes it incongruously heavy bodied for rosé colored wine of any kind. Um, the, um, it is not whey wine just flavored with cranberries. It's not cranberry wine diluted with whey. It's cranberry whey wine. That is the technique and mm -hmm. the secret. But I have a pitch that I can give on it, which is Ill I probably am illegal to even say it <laughs> verbally, possibly. Possibly. But the, as you know, the government b b covers everything on that label. The height of letters and millimeters, the contrast of the color, what you say and what you don't say. The one thing I'm not going to allow to say a thing about is the therapeutic value of an alcoholic product. I have two older retired men that buy this and buy the case because they like it and they have a small glass every afternoon. One of them is a retired science professor, so he's careful about what he says and does. He's the one that turned me on to this. He's concerned about his health, who so has a physical frequently on a PSA test. Do you know what that is? You will. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of younger men. You will. <laughs> His PSA number, they have numbers, has been advancing methodically every single year by 0.4. He's been drinking this for two to three years. It is now 0 0.05. He tells all his friends. His other friend was drinking for less than a year. A year reduced his number from six to three. If I can get that information out there, I'd be swamped to make a decent living the rest of my life. There's no way I could do that. Uh, if I'm a good marketing person, I probably could arrange that some way or other. Sure. But if the government jumps on this uh, as a therapeutic product, no. It probably is not a fluke because they've known for decades that cranberry juice is good for the urinary tract. And Ohio State University Research Department has been studying whey in relation to the prostate. So maybe so. Makes sense. But anyway, that's the story about that. And that's why it's so important for me to keep that. Uh, and then, of course, I had the second way wine, which I'm, is the process right now because my return guests want it all the time. I think they only want it for the label. Uh, this is the one. Lemon meringue pie. Uh, I shouldn't have ever called it lemon meringue pie either. Uh, and the only reason I made it because it was honor my mother is the best pastry cook ever, and I was a little bit trying to go on the label. And, and uh, I served the crackers where they give the, the crust. It's just the novelty of that. This is getting my experiment into sheer novelty. Now, that's sheer novelty. Uh, whereas the cranberry, I think, has a value of this thing, and the chocolate is so rich and so wonderful that, you know, what people say about it. But uh, I, I like to tell a story about this, too. And I, I served that, and I give my little piece of say, um, and, and this is difficult to be consistent. I can't be as consistent as Gallo. Sure. Nobody and can. I, and I have a gallery executive standing here. I keep this <laughs> uh, He said, finally said, yes, that's our byword. And then I remembered that I started drinking wine with Gallo's Hardy Burger Day. It came in gallon jugs. <laughs> I even remember that back then I was sort of amazed because it tasted exactly the same every single year. Nobody could do that. Gallo can do that. They have 22 pieces. They don't even do anything they want to do. <laughs> but anyway, and that, cause it, but, you know, in the industry, I always talk about how huge Gallo is. It's just unbelievably mm -hmm. huge. And so I was always interested in this executive. What's an executive of? <laughs> Director of Compliance. Mm. That's labels. <laughs> okay. That's amazing. Well, what other minor thing could you be an executive of? What, what about your view on the Oregon industry in general? And you've seen it grow as part of the industry, kind of an outside of the outside of the uh, the main part of it here. I I. Almost deplore that too because it is now everybody wants to get into it with the idea of either of retiring from some other job and doing something fun like uh, or, or, or making a lot of money in whatever way they can. And for it to become uh, totally automated, I think it will become what you'll be, and then it'll be just pushing marketing, just pushing the wine. 
can you give me that the second that thing on top there yeah this is what i'm saying this is my dr was my dream 30 years ago this oh, is look a, at that. this is a winery in california i mean this is just just blows me away this is what i visualized 30 some years ago for myself on an individual basis but look at that uh the data is up the fermentation <laughs> dome look at that it's laid on the wall and and it's in the in the, in the in the hillside in the hillside there i've got to go see it someday if i go nowhere uh, oh my gosh so essentially almost like totally automated in a way but it's beautifully done and I was visualizing that um, for, um, anyway, that's, actually I visualized this in the building below, which would be totally glassed, in which I could have my, my way wine being made automatically. I have all the gauges mm -hmm. and everything, and mm -hmm. truth and having people see that all in stainless steel. That, that is really like, That'd be amazing. But that's, that's long, incredible. long since gone. That's incredible. <laughs> I, uh, uh, and you know, they had a lot of money to be able to do this. Of course, it's a tremendous investment kind of thing. Uh, Palmaz Winery, it's called. And they, uh, they're from other companies. But that's my dream. But now the dream is only to maintain uh, the, the way wines, sure. at least, and have what else I can get. Do you have, uh, do you want the way wine secret to be passed along to anybody yes, else? Yes, yes, it's, it's got to be you. In fact, when I started, one of my things was because of learning the cranberries, and which they were throwing away after pressing them, mm -hmm. to go get the press, incidentally. Uh, that just blew me away. I was, when we were in every construction, we built, uh, my construction company built a lot of the cranberry bogs. Right? Mm -hmm. And when I was, I was just looking it up on my records, that was, that was almost 40 years ago. I was playing around with the cranberries, and I went to a bog that we had actually built for this guy, and I asked him, uh, tell me some cranberries, because I want to play around with this. And he said, oh my God, I couldn't dare. If they ever found out, I'd lose my contract. That is the tightest co-op I have ever heard of. <laughs> when I went up to Markham to get the juice, I had to sign into the office and sign out of the office. Cranberry thieves, I guess. Uh, I don't know why. <laughs> 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 but they had a lot of stuff and I visualized, I figured out with my system I could make this product, like my Crandallet wine, barrel it in 50 gallon drums and ship it all over the world to feed the starving people. And would be a nutritious, wonderful product for them. Sure. Until I talk to high powered people in the finance industry. Uh, no, you don't quite understand how that works. <laughs> it's not that easy, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am, right now, I'm inspired again. I'm going to start in with something new. I'm going to do with, with the way wine idea. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> That's the challenge. Anyway, well, that's all the questions we have for you. you. Oh, no, no, this, you really honestly did, and this was wonderful, and we really appreciate your time. Uh, is there anything else that we should have asked? Anything else you want to talk about? I just covered everything <laughs> as if I've given my usual pitch, even beyond which I even should be talking about, probably. We're not casting aspersions on anybody. No, uh, no, that'll be fine. Otherwise, you know, sometimes, sometimes ask me. Uh, let me use you with this. I'll ask everybody's occupations. Oh, I gotta write that down too because uh, actually you're sort of referred, you guys. So what what do you call your occupation? Ar archivist. Yeah, right. Linfield. And you are a student, and ours has our majors, and yours is Anthrop uh, anthropology. anthropology. I have a lot of friends who are anthropologists. My best wow. friend at Reed, they came a big anthropologist later. And um, in subject matter, 
I'm one of those perpetual students. That's why it's been very valuable. I can go on forever. But um, many of my guests whose major was geography are always the most educated people in the world <laughs> because they have to learn everything about every single place and the economy and the politics and everything. And so they're, sure. the rounding in that field is amazing. Um, but as I was saying, half of my guests are IT people nowadays. Uh, some men even objected to my calling for thinking in that category. Yes, he was. He was an analyst for the <laughs> Wells Fargo Bank. He had to be an <laughs> IT guy. Sure. And then the, it begs the question, what is the uh, general occupation of the other half? Oh, easy. Teachers and nurses. Interesting. They need wine. Huh? And then I've been adding homemakers because they're always both teachers and nurses. And that's, otherwise, they're obscure things, and I learn a lot about how things have changed, even the industries that I'm familiar with, sure. how they've expanded, and the technicality of it is just unbelievable. So sometimes people ask me, what is, they're what is, one of, what are the most interesting occupations you've had? Yeah, please. Okay. Well, one of them is horse masseuses. I can see needing you wine. I, no, I can see needing wine if I were a horse masseuse. <laughs> and, and then the other one that I was, uh, when it really hit me, this guy, I couldn't believe it. He was a, bar back slash voucher slash manager of male strippers. <laughs> <laughs> And a very amazing man, uh, probably by multi talented. Of your age, and he'd been in jail in one of the Caribbean countries or something or other. And his, his, um, had a nice wife, and she's, uh, and she's obviously a little older than he was. And then he had come to the bathroom and said, Yeah, uh, he was extremely mature for his age. <laughs> <laughs> he was never married if he hadn't have been. That was an interesting one. That's an interesting day. I, I love. Those kind of things, and that's why I do that. Anyway, that's excellent. Would you like to taste? Yes, I, I don't, I'm not pushing my wine. Oh, uh, please, we'll, we'll but go. I, I'm sorry that you can't taste. Oh, no, that's fine. I'm it's, used it's, to it. She's used to it. It's well, good. we will stop the formal tasting, but before my interview, uh, thank you very much for your time.